Good afternoon. Um, how is everyone doing? We're having a good time. Uh, All Tech is Human group puts on a great, uh, great set of events. They've been very busy this week. Uh, David uh, and Canadian Consulate, very grateful to you again for allowing me to be part of this. Uh, and Tim Wu, I'm very privileged, very proud to be sitting on the stage next to you and have the opportunity to ask you a bunch of questions. Tim Wu now back at Columbia, uh, where he has taught uh, with some interruption uh, since 2006, um, but most recently, of course, known as the architect of the Biden administration's competition and antitrust policy. Uh, so this man spent a couple of years in the White House, uh, close to the seat of power, um, making a bunch of decisions uh, about some of the matters that we've been talking about today. Um, and since there has been a good amount of conversation, uh, and you were here for, I think, a good bit of it, um, and we have that context uh, also kind of in the room with us, I can ask you, why the hell hasn't Washington, D.C. fixed any of these problems? <laughs> You know, this is a pretty cheery uh, crowd for such a depressing topic. I got to <laughs> say that much. I also want to say a special thanks to the Canadians. Um, here is my secret. Uh, despite all this White House stuff, I am a Canadian dual citizen. And uh, I'm very glad Canada is sponsoring this important uh, event. Um, so why did, uh, how did we fail, basically, is the, is, the, is the question of this. One of the things uh, I worked on, I, in, in antitrust and competition policy, I think we did a good job in the Biden administration, and we have kicked things up. And as you may know, we're trying to uh, we're trying Google at this exact moment. There's a case going on against Facebook, another case against Google. Maybe there'll be a case against Amazon. So there is a determined effort to try to rebalance the power that has aggregated in big tech, and I think that's important. Um, you know, even if you work for big tech, you might have to admit maybe you have a little too much power compared to everybody else. Um, and uh, that, I think, is going well. What has not gone very well, I, uh, I uh, am hesitant to admit, but have to admit, is the goal of getting at some of the core sources of power surrounding data and surrounding data collection, which are often referred to as the privacy sort of debate and the child protection debate. Do you want to come? I, I yeah. will actually ask yeah. you about those things. Uh, I know in the last uh, part of your time in the White House, uh, you were actually, I suppose, dispatched to work on uh, the push around privacy legislation, the American Data Privacy and Protection Act, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, child safety legislation that's been proposed in Congress. You know, again, yeah. uh, nothing's moved ahead. Some folks, perhaps in this room, would say uh, good news on that, on the child safety uh, bit of it. But uh, almost everyone, I assume, if we had a raise or a vote here, uh, folks would mourn the fact that nothing's happened on privacy. Why not? Yeah, I think um, I, it is. We often said in the White House that so this should be pushing like an, on an open door. Like this seems easy. So for one thing, um, the American public when polled says, you, you know, how do you feel about your privacy online? Like it's overwhelming that people feel there's, they don't have enough privacy online. Other countries have, have better laws, although not really good enough. I don't think the GDPR goes anywhere near far enough for what we need. Um, you had industry, which is, you know, dissatisfied with the potential of all kinds of overlapping laws and differences wanting something. They just wanted something. So they were uh, behind it. Now, not all of industry, you know, Facebook uh, was not behind it, and obviously Google and other companies, but Apple was on our side, you know, the Chamber of Commerce was on our side, Software Alliance. So we had a lot of big things. You had uh, the Republican Party willing to go along with us, and it all faltered on, like, embarrassingly terrible, turfy politics that I find is like a shame for American democracy. Led by Democrats. Unfortunately, our party, I'm, I'm a Democrat, some of you maybe Republicans, our party failed. I have to just like lay it down there. It uh, We got into strange turf battles between Senator Cantwell and various other people. It's like stuff that's not even, it's just boring to talk about. California, who at one point in the history of this nation uh, liked to pioneer things and then pass it on to the whole country, uh, came out very strongly against federal privacy laws um, for reasons that they thought were defensible, but to me sound a lot like turf defense and a lot like we have a new, you know, executive agency and we want to do all this stuff. So they got this, they got the Pelosi. Pelosi said she was going to support it. So 
you know, we had a pretty strong federal privacy bill. We had a lot of support for it. And um, it did, it took a big step conceptually. I don't want to turn this to a law school lecture, but I think it's incredibly important that we go beyond the model of the people who hold your data have to be sort of careful with it or delete it or do things if you ask them to, to preventing the data from being collected in the first place. I think we have to get, I mean, I think everyone knows this, that the notice and consent model is broken. The people have known that for years. And what you have to do is ban data collection in certain forms or in make it absolutely limited to what the thing is. You know, if someone has a dog walking app, um, it shouldn't be collecting everything about you and reading all your emails. It should be about dog walking. You know, and, and you know who else is behind us? The intelligence agencies were behind us on this stuff. So like, this is a problem. We've created this spy architecture that other countries use, you know, to spy on us. And so we didn't, like the, the forces you might think would be against this kind of stuff were on side. We couldn't get it done. It was an indictment of American democracy and a little bit indictment on of, of the left, I hate to say, but overall our system of government. So we should have this. Everybody wants it. Um, there should be much less data collected. It should be that which is strictly and absolutely necessary for the functions being performed and nothing else. And that is clearly what we need. And the question is making that happen. Let me push you a little bit on that question. What, in fact, do you believe the left did to scuttle uh, privacy legislation? <laughs> so I already mentioned California, and I think they, if they were here, would say, well, we thought that, you know, they, they have their side of this argument. But I think that it is, nobody thinks they're being turfy, but you get, it happens. Um, some of the senators, prominent senators on the left, felt they needed to control the legislation or as in a tit for tat for other kinds of battles, just stuff that's not very interesting. And on what should be the easiest form of protection, child privacy protection, we also failed. You know, there was nobody, if you ask the American public, do you think children should have stronger privacy protections they have now? I don't think, I think you would get 99.9%, .9%, I don't know, whatever support. And, you know, in a democracy, 99, like 60% of the people should get what they want. 70, 99%, if it's not unconstitutional abuse of other things, like, it's not unconstitutional violation of people's fundamental rights. 99% of the people should be able to get what they want. And children's privacy is in that category. The fact we can't pass it is an indictment of our current system. And I blame the left slightly because we get weirdly involved in battles in the left that I remember some strange, it was almost like a political parody. We had some crazy battle going on between some of the LGBT groups and some of the eating disorder groups were like fighting with each other about all this kind of stuff. And like, I know people have interests. I know they feel very strongly, but we are failing to do stuff. And if you were on the left, it's partially our fault. And yet uh, there are some... Odd... Children's protection. I mean, you know, the Republicans have not been that bad on that issue. It's, I, I am ashamed to say we're worse on the issue of children's protection than, than, than the right. And yet we, we do have, you know, these kind of Trojan horse concerns, right? Uh, Senator Marsha Blackburn said some very uh, uh, wretched things lately about uh, how COSA, the Kids Online Safety Act... Uh, you know, could be used. Uh, potentially, someone will find the exact quote, um, but essentially to, to sort of police uh, children's interaction with transgender issues and ideas. Um, so perhaps some of these concerns are real? Our view was not that view. We didn't obviously agree with Senator Blackburn's statements. You know, it's very hard, difficult to police what Republicans are going to say or do. But I think basic the basic goal of the children's protection law actually related to the last panel is we wanted to force companies to spend more on trust and safety and on children's protection that's all we wanted to do uh, the president felt that was very important we didn't want facebook to be firing 20,000 workers or um, you know whatever they call that twitter company to be firing all their staff who take care of this stuff because they're too afraid of liability that's what we wanted to accomplish uh, I have friends in trust and safety at companies who won't disclose. They're like, you don't, the United States isn't really putting much pressure on us. So no one, 
you know, they don't, they're not really after us. Europeans get after us. All you do is occasionally have a hearing. We show up, they yell at us for a couple hours, then we go home. Yeah. And okay. And then we know we don't have to do anything. So they don't, they don't have to really spend money on this at all. And until we have someone, you know, forget about these sessions where you yell at them. Unless they're facing billions of dollars of liability, they will not hire and keep the people to really make this happen. I mean, companies are for-profit institutions. They respond to financial incentives that look like billions of dollars, not like mosquito bites. And we have failed to do this. We have failed to create the incentives to make companies invest seriously in trust and safety. And that's what we wanted to do. And we've gotten distracted by a lot of stuff. We've let this pass. And I think it is a disservice to our children. So uh, I want to step back and, and let's talk about competition, antitrust, uh, the scale of, of tech firms. Um, how many people here work for a large technology company, if you're willing to raise your hand, uh, a company that measures its revenues in billions? Okay. Well, I'm trying to get more money for your trust and safety. So I'm on your side. There you go. Uh, and they're, they're probably in those departments. Um, but let me let me – let me mush a few ideas together and maybe give yeah. you a, um, a a bad question that hopefully you'll give a good answer to. I saw um, your former White House colleague, uh, Dr. Alondra Nelson, uh, who's Deputy Director of the Office of Science and Technology Policy, um, talk recently at Columbia at uh, uh, the Knight First Amendment Institute. Um, and she talked about uh, the relationship between technology and that idea of the poly crisis, all these complicated you know, issues that we face in the world, uh, whether it's climate change or interstate conflict or what have you. Um, and she noted that in some ways of sort of depicting the poly crisis, tech is often sort of off to the side. It's sort of, you know, frontier technologies and, you know, maybe some aspect of disinformation, misinformation, cybersecurity, et cetera. And she was arguing, you know, tech is actually related to all of these larger problems, in some case underlies, and in some cases in conversation with and reflexively, you know, um, uh, uh, related to these things. Um, so if you accept that premise, right, um, I want to ask you uh, the problem of scale in, in the current tech ecosystem how does it relate to the quote unquote poly crisis? Uh, is it in there? Is, is it part of that that sort of complicated m mash of ideas? Well, I'll say first that Landra Nelson is awesome and everything she says must be correct. <laughs> <laughs> but um, moving on from that, the problem of scale is, was the greatest challenge of the 20th century at some level and even though we thought, I think there was a moment in the early 21st century when people thought we had moved on from scale or that life was fundamentally different or that like small uh, businesses and small startup stuff were going to rule the world. Uh, that hasn't happened and we're back with scale. Scale is a almost wonder drug. Um, it makes possible many things that seem magical, but I'm also reminded of the saying that where something has gone wrong, something is probably too big. And so, you know, all of the, I think that almost all the challenges we face in contemporary, all these uh, poly crises at some level, not uniformly, but many of them link to the problem of scale and things getting beyond human size, beyond our easy capacity to deal with, whether that's um, you know populations, whether that's systems, whether that's schools, airports, tech companies, you name it. And so that's and I am you know as a in my heart you know this child protection and privacy are my sort of side gig. My at core, I'm a structural antitrust. Um, economic uh, person. And I think that getting a handle on the dangers and possibilities of scale is core to building a future that works uh, for every everyone. Now, I've said a lot of abstract stuff. What does it mean uh, a little more um, concretely? Um, we, as I said, I think in the early 20th century, people had thought that the advantages of scale had disappeared that little startups like Google were beating big companies like Microsoft. 
um, that little bloggers were beating existing news organizations that, you know, the advantages of being big and disappeared. That all seems like a bad joke 15 years later. Or not a bad joke, but a passing moment. I mean, there are still times where people have individual success and so forth. But, you know, go try and launch a, you know, go try and launch a e-commerce site to compete with Amazon. And odds are you're going to find it a challenging thing. And the main reason is Amazon has an extraordinary scale. Try and launch a search engine that, you know, competes with Google um, and their scale of daily usage and so on. So in all these areas, scales become this extraordinarily important um, competitive determiner. And I think the problem with scale, there's a lot of problems with scale, but mainly I think from an economic equality standpoint, scale tends to concentrate wealth. When you look over the economies of the past and over the course of humanity, the most sort of concentrated scale economies, like, you know, the PlayStation model have concentrated much wealth and created dangerously unstable systems. So that's what I'm worried about. This guy knows a very vague, but you said it was a, it was an open-ended question. <laughs> Absolutely. And so let's make it a little more close and talk about news of the day. Um, so uh, Google uh, now on trial uh, in, in the government's uh, suit against it, uh, the first of, of two uh, related to competition and antitrust. And I understand you uh, took the train and joined the trial yesterday. I was, uh, I was there. That's true. How did it feel in the courtroom? I thought it was fascinating, exhilarating, almost like going to a free TED Talk. Um, <laughs> be, well, actually, a mixture of like Law and Order and Ted somehow. So you had Hal uh, Varian, the yeah, economist the, for Google, you, delivering his uh, well sort of statements. And the first thing they did uh, was to put Hal Varian on, uh, and Hal Varian is the chief economist of Google. He has a little bit of a resemblance to Bill Gates, so it had a little bit of a like '90s feel to it. And he certainly had kind of the mannerisms. I, I don't. People here are probably too old to remember, but Bill Gates was deposed in the Microsoft uh, trial back in the '90s, and it came off terribly. He kept like arguing and saying, being annoying, and everyone sort of had liked him, sort of, and he came off as sort of evil nerd kind of figure. And uh, Halvarian, you know, they'd ask him questions like, you know, it was a search on Google give you a broader set of results than a search on Amazon? You say, well, I don't know if I can answer that. Depends what you mean by the word broad. He said, well, more sources of information. Well, really, it's still hard to say. Can you be a little more? It went on and on like that for hours. So I kind of enjoyed that. I don't know why. And then, <laughs> But then the most... Um, You're a lawyer. The art of good lawyering is, is, is something. And I mean, there's a reason people like legal dramas. But the, the, the most interesting part, the government's core case is that despite being you know, a relatively cheery, friendly place, Google, um, that Google has been very aware of human behavioral tendencies, including um, habit, uh, the effect of defaults on, on choice making, and has used, you know, since it, it, it search engine kind of um, rose to popularity because it was clearly better than what was around. But since then has been very thoughtful and careful about subtly maintaining itself and its market dominance and uh, shutting out potential competitors or starters by using its money to make sure it has the defaults, takes advantage of habit and does a lot of subtle things to keep it there. And they had a professor from uh, Caltech who's a behavioral economist. And that's why I was saying it was like a TED Talk, because he was talking about all the various cog And then proving with Google Documents that they were aware of this and trying to sort of manipulate people so that they generally ended up with uh, Google. So that, that is the core of the interest. Very, I, I just, uh, you know, obviously I work for the Biden administration, so I hope the government wins. But even just as a effort to understand what, power looks like in the 21st century the you know the subtler forms I, I think 20th century power is much more industrial or military um you know now it's more about controlling people's attention subtly shaping people's decisions you know scale in a different way and, and the trial is a good way is very good at trying to 
understand what economic power looks like 21st century. So let me ask you, if the DOJ case fails, mm -hmm. what's at stake? What If it fails, uh, you know, uh, what does that mean for this project uh, to potentially address 21st century economic power, uh, the network effects, all of the sorts of ideas that, that, that you're working on? Um, how does it affect perhaps the other case about Google? We've got another one coming up around market dominance in, in digital advertising. Uh, and how does it affect the case against my, uh, Facebook? I think there's two things I'd say. First, I think that while the Google trial is about the 2010s and the deals that Google made with Apple to stay out of search, I think that's the main indictment is that Google paid off Apple to stay out of search. Um, that looking at the past, it'll matter for the future and specifically for the AI markets and the ongoing contest for what commercial AI looks like. You know, Google feels threatened by um, what's happening in the AI market. Um, they uh, have obviously their own products are rushing to, and the question is in some ways whether they can use the tactics that they use in the 2010s the economic soft economic power is talking about uh, for the next contest. In terms of the second thing I'd say is I think that if the government loses all these case, cases, we enter an era of long-term monopolization where the big three, four, five tech companies are pretty entrenched. And the government will have effectively blessed the models that uh, these companies use to, to uh, keep competition at bay. In Facebook's case, it was buying its major competitors like Instagram and, and WhatsApp. Case of Google, it was, it's all sort of money related, uh, paying to be the default, paying to keep Apple out of search, paying to make Samsung make sure that it doesn't develop a different uh, search alternative. I think having blessed those techniques, I would predict that those companies stay in their seat of power for much longer than is natural or healthy. And if there is any example of an entity on the planet that seems to be sort of wh wherever you can point to problems with it, it seems to be because the, even the humans working there don't really understand <laughs> how it works or how the system operates. It's Google, uh, in my, my view. Um, but let me ask about with this with regard to AI. Um, you know, this is a big week for AI in Washington, D.C. We've had, I think, three uh, AI hearings in the Senate this week. Uh, we had uh, the Senate Majority Leader hosting the first of his AI forums, uh, largely populated by uh, men in suits who run large technology companies. Um, you know, uh, lots of discussion about what to do. Uh, should we have a standalone agency, an FDA for artificial intelligence um, you know, in your view, uh, what's the best path forward? Um, if if we do find these firms in this unassailable position, um, is there any hope for AI regulation? Uh, well, there's uh, certainly the potential of AI regulation going forward. By the way, the men in suits, I feel I'd call them men who have put on suits for the occasion, but <laughs> feel very uncomfortable in suits and look strange in them. But that's my... Uh, so to snark your back. I feel that uh, I am um, speaking slightly against my former employers, um, concerned with the direction of AI regulation, mainly because I approach these questions from a structural power issue. I'm mainly interested in power and its rebalancing. I mean, the fundamental reason I believe in the cases against Facebook, Google, and maybe Amazon. It's not because I think they're particularly evil companies. I think there have been much eviler companies and are much eviler companies in history. I just think any overly concentrated power is dangerous. And the longer it stays there, the worse it gets. And that rebalancing is necessary. A sort of constant rebalancing is necessary for the health of any long-term democracy or economy. Actually, that's what my next book is about, which I I'm trying to write um, about the constant cycle of trying to rebalance power in a, in a, in a democracy and a long-term sustainable economy. So I'm worried about the current round of legislation, um, that it is shaped by uh, 
many of the big players who frankly seem interested in it largely to insulate them and make them the player. Now, they, I think they have legitimate concerns too. And I think government doesn't want us to be conquered by evil robots and is concerned that it was behind the ball. But behind it is should be and is this question, is this leaving the market to three players? And that's what I'm worried about. Let's talk about just briefly. We only have a couple minutes left. Um, with regard to labor issues and artificial intelligence, um, what are you concerned about at the moment? I mean, we've got everything from you know the Hollywood strike and this sort of focus on you know, writers and the extent to which creatives may be replaced, uh, on through to headline after headline about uh, the way in which you know people in uh, 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 global majority countries are. Uh, being employed to look at the worst stuff and build the classifiers that are going into these large language models for a dollar fifty an hour. Um, how, how do you think about the labor issues around artificial intelligence broadly? Well, let me start with labor first, and I feel very strong it's about time labor got its due, and that we have neglected the interests of workers for far too long in this country. Uh, you know, for forty years we sort of took labor as a cost and thought that was fine, when actually it was us. <laughs> you know what I mean? And focused entirely, especially in antitrust, but all these areas like in directing all our efforts to trying to make stuff cheap and no uh, concern about producers or workers. And, you know, I think the White House has this White House, and I'm going to sound like a person, but I really do believe the president wants to change that, has tried to change it. We had unions come in all, all the time, and we're very focused on trying to make things better for workers. So that's my political message, but I believe it. The uh, AI and labor issue, I think, is complicated. Um, I don't, I, I really think the history of predicting technology's effect on work uh, is filled with gross errors that are almost embarrassing. Uh, in, the, in the 50s and 60s, anyone who looks studies this knows that everybody predicted because of more advanced technologies that the work week would fall to you know, 30, 40, 20 hours. There's a Life magazine issue from the 60s somewhere that's called like the crisis of leisure. What are we going to do with all this free time? <laughs> and instead, you know, even though we have these events, we have email, I mean, things that seem impossibly magical. We have you know, telephones, we have email, we have um, baby monitors. I don't know, you have everything. Um, people work more than ever you know, for less money. Most families have two people working. Uh, not against women being in the workforce, but it is striking that at one point, you know, in the 60s, they thought we'll only have to have one member of every family work for 20 hours a week. That'll be enough for everybody. And now most families have two people working, killing themselves. Um, you know, we have, we, uh, Sherry Turkle was talking about children being neglected and someone asked a great question about like, what is this? So this is crisis. So, you know, we've been wrong over and over about what technology will do. And I think we'll be wrong about AI. My kind of fear about AI is less, not less that we'll have less work, but that AI, that we'll all kind of become middle managers. In Once something becomes potentially more efficient, suddenly everyone's asked to do more of it. So, you know, if you might have been asked to say you're a lawyer and you're asked to like file one complaint a month and then AI makes it possible to write complaints a lot easier. Suddenly you need to write 20 of them a month. Like we have this weird I, tendency when things get more efficient. I mean, emails made it more possible to communicate with, so we communicate more. And in some weird converted way, and suppose instead of there just being some amount of work we have to get done, I think humans have a weird capability to invent or create work or something happens or we need to be more efficient or do more work. And... I don't fully understand the mathematics, of it, but I have a weird feeling AI will make us more busy, but we'll be like supervising 100 AIs and we'll all kind of like be middle managers and not doing any work, what you might call real work ourselves, like actually doing the writing or the creation or the drawing or the things that are kind of rewarding as opposed to supervising the AIs that are doing it. And that is kind of what I fear. I fear kind of for the human condition. This is sort of a... Um, uh, 19th kind of go back to 19th century Ruskin kind of what is the quality of the work that we do and how does that matter to the human experience I think we forget that sometimes it's like it's not just the amount or type of work it's the satisfaction Marx had a little bit on this alienation of labor um, you know you think it's alienating to be in a factory line what about just being someone 
who sits there approving the products of others. So there you go. I think we are uh, pretty much out of time. Can I ask one more question, David? Okay, I've got three more on my list, and then we'll we'll finish up here. Okay, uh, three more questions. <laughs> uh, they were, uh, you know, why do we need a robot penal code? Which I know is something oh, you've yeah. written about. Yeah, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, is there a decoupling looming where, to some extent, the uh, outside of maybe these three, you know, big tech firms, we can't even have the technological imagination for where AI is going? Is the federal government investing enough? Uh, in avoiding that circumstance in, in public mm -hmm. sector and in, uh, you know, university investment? That's the second question. And I suppose the last one, uh, you can choose which of these you want to answer. What should the folks in this room do about any of this? Uh, okay, I'll take the first question because... Robot penal code Yeah, robot, uh, <laughs> robot penal code, because I think our approach to AI regulation right now is kind of wrong-headed in the sense that there is a lot of slightly more abstract concerns about um, kind of cataclysmic events and things, not all of which is unjustified, but a sort of, at least in government, lack of attention. I know a lot of people in this room are concerned about this, but lack of attention to obvious, more real, visceral harms, like advanced fraud. Um, I know people here are worried about electoral fraud, but uh, and so forth. And I think in some ways we're not being tough enough in those areas. In some ways, we're over-regulatory with AI, potentially over-regulatory. In some more abstract sense, you talk about licensing to use AI and, AI, and much under-regulatory when it comes to the clear, concrete harms that are going on. Um, you know, a good example uh, of this is what we're pressuring tech companies to do. I think we, in some ways, put pressure on the hardest thing, which is misinformation, and not enough pressure on the easy it's not easy to deal with, but more obviously concrete in its harm, which are um, things like the sexual abuse of children and other very visceral, real-world harms. Um, so I think we should have a robot uh, penal code. Um, I think um, it needs to be uh, strong and include death penalty for robots. <laughs> you heard it here first. Tim Wu, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure.